Throughout 2020 and early 2021, one of the most prominent faces of the Boogaloo movement was Mike Dunn. Dunn was known for defiant protests where he would thwart gun laws throughout Virginia, catching one arrest for which charges were later dropped. Dunn suddenly backed away from the movement and scrubbed his presence from the internet following an incident in February 2021 where he turned in a would-be comrade to law enforcement. Mired by accusations of being a federal informant, Dunn all but disappeared. Until last month. In February 2022, Dunn resurfaced on social media, using TikTok to document an apparent journey to join the Ukrainian resistance against Russian invaders. On March 3rd, I sat down with Mike to ask about his plans for Ukraine and allegations that he is a federal informant. He has since confirmed that he is indeed in Ukraine. We are recording this on March 3rd, 2022, uh, as Mike's waiting for his passport. Um, so, Mike, tell me about what are your plans for Ukraine? So my intention currently is uh, to go over there and volunteer in any capacity that I can, uh, whether it be for the Foreign Legion, uh, with the experience that I do have, or the Ukrainian Army as a foreign national, a volunteer, uh, for a three-year contract, or if I have to be a potato pillar, I'll peel potatoes, uh, but I'm going to help in any way that I can. Um, how do you plan to actually get there and join the Ukrainian fight? So uh, I'll get my passport at 2 o'clock today. Um, I fly out Saturday. I'll fly to Warsaw, Poland. I have a Polish address I can quarantine at. And then I'll cross the border into uh, Ukraine uh, via vehicle, obviously, and go to the recruitment station in a, I can't say the town, but go to recruitment station there turn in my, my paperwork and say I'm here to volunteer. And so which military apparatus do you believe that you'd be joining? So I have all my paperwork for the Foreign Legion. I'm sending the rest of it in today with my passport, um, LE paperwork, uh, my DD-214, uh, weapons training, weapons certifications, etc. Uh, there were two volunteers in the embassy the other day that have already had their interview. Um, they're just they're getting a special uh, visa even though visas are waived the ukrainian embassy here is still issuing them um and they have no prior service experience but yet they got accepted into the foreign legion, legion because they had relative experience um so i'll be submitting all my paperwork for that and flying to poland and talk with the embassy there if not accepted into the foreign legion then i'll go for the ukrainian army and sign a contract with them as a foreign national and to be clear you do have u.s military experience you are a veteran yes i do yeah. um not a combat vet however does that make a difference in your ability to get in and join? Uh, apparently not, because there are people that have gotten in with not even military experience. They just have relative experience, whether that be armed security, law enforcement work, uh, people that have gotten in with no combat experience. Um, so people are joining without it. Um, my understanding was you were medically but honorably discharged from the United States Marines. That is correct. Is, is there any medical issue that would nope, that could come up there? I've actually been, uh, I've been cleared to even re-enlist here in the U.S. if I wanted to. Um, so it seems like you're serious about this. Yes. Why are you doing this? Uh, I don't like Russia. I don't like Putin. I don't like a former KGB, uh, USSR spy. Um, I have no love for the man. I don't really care for NATO either. Um, but on the same end, after watching the bravery of the Ukrainian uh, leader, uh, Mr. Zelensky, and the bravery of the Ukrainian people who have ha not had the right to bear arms as we do in the U.S., had to have an emergency vote to allow them to have arms. Um, after watching that bravery, it inspired me to put money where my mouth is when I talk about liberty and freedom and go over there and help. Now, obviously, I'm against foreign militant involvement. I'm against the U.S. and the military over there. I'm against enlisting in your country's military and going to protect some other country or an asset. However, I'm all for individual individuals volunteering, and that's what I'm doing. So you, you, if you were still in the Marines, you wouldn't want to be de deployed to Ukraine as a Marine. This is kind of like something you want to do individually. Correct. Um, you know, in the past, you know, two years, your, your activism was basically in the world of the, the Boogaloo movement. Correct. What, what do you see as the intersection, I guess, between what you're planning on doing now and your time in the Boogaloo? Uh, we stood for liberty and freedom for all people. Uh, we stood against violations of the NAP, the non-aggression principle. Um, the Boogaloo movement is not what it was when I was a part of it. Uh, but when I was a part of it, that's what we stood for. And watching citizens be attacked, civilians be attacked and murdered in Ukraine, and watching big government, which is Russia, uh, push in on Ukraine, um, I think going over there is in the spirit of the Boogaloo movement and embodies those ideals. Are you trying to advance the cause of the Boogaloo movement, or is it just kind of that the Boogaloo movement inspired you uh, to go there and do this? I think that a lot of what I participated in while I was in the Boogaloo movement um, 
I, I wouldn't say that I'm necessarily trying to advance the cause of the Boogaloo movement as I've been kind of out of it for the past year, year and a half. Um, but I will say that the Boogaloo movement is going to be represented over there uh, by individuals who have given more to the Boogaloo movement than anybody crying online has. Um, and, and we will represent the Boogaloo movement over there. If it furthers the cause, so be it. When you say we, are you planning to bring other Boogaloos to Ukraine? Yes. Uh, I have a few that are following me there. I have one going with me there. This interview marks one of Mike Dunn's first discussions with the media in over a year. When Dunn first rose to prominence, he had described working at a jail as a radicalizing moment for him. He said that seeing what he viewed as abhorrent treatment of inmates by law enforcement had turned him from a conservative into a libertarian. And yet, he says, he spent the last year again as a correctional officer, even graduating from the Criminal Justice Academy of Central Virginia. And so speaking of those past year and a half, where have you been? Working. I've been uh, keeping to myself, staying out of the limelight. I actually took a job at a jail um, and put on a badge. Uh, because I, I can't cry about a system if I'm not willing to be a difference in the system. And uh, I worked my job like anybody else with respect. I uh, did my job correctly uh, and took care of those around me. I didn't put nobody in jail. Uh, I kept them safe while they were there and made sure they had what they needed. So just to be clear, you, be, you became a jail guard again? Correct. I became a correctional officer here in the state of Virginia. So I remember way back July 2020, you talking about how what sort of turned you into a you know anti-government, you know, boogaloo, etc. was hesitation with what you saw while working in a jail previously, Correct. The, Correct. the oppression of people and yep. all that sort of stuff. Uh, how, how do you square rejoining that system? Uh, being a difference in it. We all whine about a system. We all cry about a system, but it's hard to cry about something if you're not willing to be the difference in that system. Um, I learned a lot more with my year working at the jail again. I learned, I learned a lot of stuff. Um, everybody knew me. Everybody knew who I was and what I've done. Uh, but it, it was an interesting time to learn and, and be the difference that I feel they needed. Um, and, you know, that's, that's the best way I know how to answer that question is I cannot sit here and cry about a system if I'm not willing to try to be a part and change it. How in the world did Mike Dunn, who's on Vice and all and photographed with guns and yelling about the Boogaloo and everything, get another job in law enforcement after all of that? Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, you know, I, I'm, uh, I work hard. And I haven't uh, in any way uh, committed a terroristic act. Uh, I had the, uh, what I needed, the training that I needed, uh, the experience that I needed, and I was somebody they were looking for. Uh, they were very well aware of who they hired. Once again, I, I won't state the jail association. They were very well aware of who they hired. They said they were willing to give me a chance. You know, I took my chance. I had a great time working with them. Um, the interesting thing is when I went to the academy, and I won't say what academy it was, but when I went to the academy, um, I was actually, the, the terrorism class that teaches on domestic terrorism, I was actually, a video of me was played in that class. And, you know, it, that was an interesting uh, point in time there. So in, in training about terrorist activity, which you're sitting in as a student, yep. you see yourself as the terrorist Correct. on the screen. Uh, a video from uh, um, Richmond on Lobby Day was and did, played. Did they make me. that connection? Were you sitting there yes. with a smirk on your face? Or were they like, and here's uh, the current student, former terrorist? Everybody had a lot of questions. There, there was some hatred. Uh, some, some people were like, "Oh, wow!" Uh, everybody had questions. The guy instructing the class told me, you know, "Hey, give me some accurate information on the Boogaloo movement, so that I can make my PowerPoint more accurate from somebody who's in it, and not just stuff that we've gathered offline or from other sources." And uh, so I gave him some more information to help him kind of understand the movement more, so he could teach about it from a better perspective. Um, but. It was definitely interesting. People had a lot of questions. But you weren't presenting yourself as a former. Like you weren't saying like, oh, I, I used to be in this and now I've switched sides. You're just- I never said I switched sides or anything like that. They knew that I had a, had a news article on me in months. Yeah. Uh, so they knew I was just, you know, chilling at that point. What precisely happened on the night of February 3rd, 2021 remains a mystery. Both Mike Dunn and the man he turned in, David Phillips, offered extremely different explanations. That night, Dunn left messages for a Florida-based Boogaloo boy named Marcus Suarez, preempting allegations of being a so-called snitch. Some bad stuff went down. Um, somebody else got arrested and I may be walking free because I, I haven't done anything wrong. The other person is the only one in the wrong and it's gonna make me look like a snitch when I haven't done anything wrong. So whatever you may hear, just, uh, just please keep it quiet because I have not done anything. I really don't know what to do. I have nowhere to go right now. Um, but I know that if I walk free, it's going to make me look like a snitch when really it's just because I haven't done anything wrong. I love you, buddy.
In a later phone call, David Phillips also called Suarez, alleging that Dunn had set him up. If you tell people what happened here, people, a lot of guys are going to fucking be heartbroken. And they're going to be like, damn, man, if my Dunn was a rat, like, why should I even try? You know what I mean? Okay, just to come out clear, he came out clean to you saying that he's with the FBI. Yes. Phillips was later arrested and served a 10-month sentence in federal prison for illegally possessing ammunition as a felon. Now, a year later, I asked Mike to clarify his story of the events that had taken place. So, I mean, a year and a half ago, the thing that seemed to take you off the map was a situation in Maine uh, with regarding David Phillips. So, in your own words, what happened there? So, I met Mr. Phillips back in uh, maybe... September of 2020. Um, well, actually, he, it was before that when I was in Texas doing political work uh, for YAL, Young Americans for Liberty. Uh, Mr. Phillips began reached out to me, me not knowing who this gentleman was, and began sending me donations to support a lot of things we were doing. And I'm talking good money donations. The gentleman had no job. I don't know where he got the money, anything like that. But I was young and naive, so I accepted it. I was happy. And he told me, he said, you know, you come on to Maine. Uh, and we can uh, set up like a Boogaloo Boy compound type thing. I was all hyped about it. I picked up gear, a lot of gear, um, got prepared for the trip to Maine, joined Mr. Phillips. Uh, we proceeded to Maine. Uh, we were there for a little while, and uh, apparently Mr. Phillips was using drugs really bad. I was not aware of that. Um, so he began being very haywire. He actually came... When he picked me up in Virginia, he drove me to Maine. He met my parents. My parents were very wary of him because of how he acted. He was very wired. Um, but I was young and naive. I went with him. Uh, I got to Maine. Uh, some situations unfolded. Uh, Mr. Phillips began talking out of his head. Uh, even talked about, at one point, planning to bomb a hospital. Uh, he had explosive devices. Um, once again, uh, I don't agree with getting charged for possessing these items, but I do want to make note of something. Uh, when I finally said, okay, I've had enough, I want to leave, he refused to let me leave. Uh, I made him let me leave. Uh, long story short, I drove to the police station and I told him what was going on. I was 100% up front. I did not want to use the police, but it was either use them for the job that they're supposed to do mm -hmm. or, you know, take somebody's life to stop something from happening and go to jail for 10, 15 years. And so I went ahead and I told them what was going on. Uh, it took them about five days to arrest him. Uh, I think there were like four separate agencies used. Um, I know that when he was arrested, at the time he was arrested, I know this for sure, 100%. Um, he had two fully automatic weapons on him, which once again, I do not agree with being charged with, but I want this made note of. He had two fully automatic weapons on him, explosive material, uh, thousands and thousands of rounds of ammunition, some of which was mine, which I had to fill out a paperwork for the ATF to get back my ammo. Um, but in the, uh, in the end, he was only charged with uh, possession of 200 rounds of ammunition. Um, and they only charged him from a video footage at a store where he bought the ammunition. Um, that store has a video of me buying my ammunition, but I bought mine legally. Uh, I paid for it myself. I bought my own ammo. I took care of it because that was another accusation floating around was Mr. Phillips was buying ammunition for my gun. Uh, Mr. Phillips donated a lot of money to me. Uh, I used a lot of money to buy ammunition for myself. Um, I'm on video there at the store buying ammunition. Uh, Mr. Phillips was on video at the store buying ammunition. They arrested him based off of that. Uh, he did 10 months and was released. I was obviously notified um, because of the, the initial conflict there between the two of us. Um, and that's all he did. He did 10 months for possession of ammo as a felon with 54 prior charges, uh, several of which are violent. And he walks away with a charge of 200 rounds of ammo with me knowing what all he had there. And it raised a lot of questions for myself mentally because obviously everybody started going crazy. The first phone call I made when I was leaving, I made to a gentleman, I won't say his name, you know who he is. And I said, this is gonna make me out to look like a fed. And that's what happened. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of your people sitting on their butts in the movement that haven't gotten out there, haven't gotten out there and protested, haven't come, haven't gone to Richmond and broken the law or Newport News and broken the law, open carrying, willing to, to give up their life for their rights. They've just been posting online. A lot of them started, you know, calling me a federal informant. Um, and so I stepped away from the movement uh, so it wouldn't cause as much division. Um, a lot of people left with me. If you haven't noticed, uh, there hasn't been much activity in the Boogaloo movement since I've walked away. There's been 
a few minor protests, nothing really major. Um, and uh, I walked away from it. Um, and just, you know, that's, that's kind of that's what happened. I do not regret what I did. I slept well at night. Uh, my conscience is clear. I did what I felt was right. Uh, the question I ask myself is why would somebody out of the blue who I don't know who they are, who doesn't have a job, send me several thousand dollars, convince me to come with him, and then try to get me to participate in violating the non-aggression principle against civilians to make history. And then in the end, because I flip the tables, I'm the one that turns out to be a fed and it ruins my voice. It, 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 it raises some very interesting questions. So, I mean, you turned him in because you believed that he was going to commit a violent act. One thousand percent. Yes. And then he's only charged for ammunition. He's only what, charged what for do ammunition. You, what do you make of that, and how do you respond to people in your movement who have basically looked at that and said, therefore, Mike turned him in for ammo? Correct. And so Mike's probably an informant. <laughs> this is a question I want to ask anybody who says that. Um, number one, I want, I want them to ask themselves, uh, why would the federal government burn a federal informant like that on such a simple charge of ammunition? Number two, why would the federal government use... Uh, I believe it was four agencies is what the article said to get a man over just solely ammunition um, oh, why you know why why would it take so many for just possession of ammunition um, and and three a movement that I loved and I gave everything for um, I ruined certain aspects of my life for uh, I built the movement I made the movement helped make the movement extremely big why would I do all of that just to just to bust on one guy for 200 rounds of ammo? It doesn't. It's not logically consistent, um, and that's all I want to ask the movement to think about. I don't want my spot back in the movement, but I want the movement to understand and ask themselves these questions because it's not logically consistent. I would ruin all of that for the sake of 200 rounds of ammunition. There are so many other people that could be taken down for bigger issues. Obviously, there was something more to that than just ammunition possession. And I think uh, oh, that's all I want the movement to do is ask themselves, those, ask themselves those questions. Are you implying that David was doing what you are accused of? Um, I'm, I hate accusing anybody of being a fed. I've only accused one person of helping the federal government uh, out throughout my whole time. I've only accused one person of that. I'm not accusing David Phillips of that, but I would like people to ask themselves questions of why would somebody who doesn't know me donate thousands of dollars, invite me to come live with him, uh, plan something like that, expect me to participate, and then when it's all done, walks away with basically no charges and supposedly done 10 months in prison, in jail, with 54 prior charges. It, it doesn't make sense. And so at the, at, the end of the, at the end of the day, I'm not accusing him of being a federal informant, um, but I am accusing him of, well, I'm accusing the situation of, of things not meeting the eye. Uh, and I'm completely, 1,000% rejecting the idea that I am or was or ever were a federal informant. Um, so in your telling of that story, you did just describe speaking with local law enforcement about Correct. that issue. Correct. Um, I'm sure that the feds were up your butt <laughs> during that time period. Yes. Uh, what communications have you had uh, uh, with feds? Any time that anything has happened, uh, I've always been questioned. I've always been asked questions. Whether it's a phone call or a visit, I've always been asked questions. Um, I've made it clear from the start to the federal government that I would answer any questions they had um, about the Russian government and their involvement with the interview they did with me. Um, I would answer questions about that, but You're I would talking about RT, correct? But I would never answer questions about Boogaloo Boys. Um, I've stuck by that. No Boogaloo Boy has ever been arrested that has pointed back and said Mike Dunn is the reason I got arrested. David Phillips, uh, when that situation happened, they tried to veer off the path and ask other questions about Boogaloo Boys. I made it clear to them, I will not talk about Boogaloo Boys. David Phillips was not a Boogaloo Boy himself. Um, I've got photographs of him as a Trump supporter um, fighting Black Lives Matter groups here in D.C. Um, as recent as two months prior to the situation that we had. Um, his claim to be a Boogaloo Boy, he never was a Boogaloo Boy. Um, when I even got there camping, I, I found uh, Nazi books underneath his underneath his bed inside the back of his camper uh, as I was snooping because I'm an interested person I want to know who am I staying with even though it was ill-advised that I go there um, and uh, I don't think it was Boogaloo um, but I've never I've never said anything on any type of uh, Boogaloo individual uh, I've even got one uh, let me see if I can remember his name Rhino he goes by Rhino Rhino 6 uh, that has even accused me of sending FBI to his house. For one, Rhino 6 is a clout chaser. It's been proven. Um, for two, anytime I've asked, 
directly to, okay, well, what question did they ask you that only me and you knew that he claims happened? He's never been able to tell me that question. He's never been able to tell me what they said. He just says, oh, I've got the information. I'm going to release it one day. Okay, well, if you really had the information, then release it and show your side. Tell a fact. But don't sit here and just tell these ideas and, and not back them up with proof. Um, but, you know, uh, he got visited. Uh, but people seem to forget that at the end of the day, all of us have been visited. We've all had our door knocked on. Just because they come to you and they say something to you doesn't point to one person. I've had so many questions asked me, and then I have to rack my brain and wonder, okay, who's saying something? Because I've said something to a couple different people about this. Somebody talked. It all happens. Mm -hmm. uh, but I vehemently refute that. So as you were just describing the thing about David Phillips, you did you did actually just sort of say that at some point the FBI asked you about him. Um, about who? About David Phillips. Did you did you talk to the FBI about David Phillips? The FBI actually showed up at the police station when I was talking to them about everything that was going on. Mm -hmm. um, they actually showed up. I, I guess they had one. It was in Bangor, Maine. I guess they had one nearby. Uh, showed up and took questions uh, because obviously it's a serious situation when you go to a police station and you say, hey, I've got a gentleman that wants to kill me refused to allow me to leave. I had to get myself out. And then on top of that is planning to bomb a hospital. Uh, you, you've got federal agencies that are going to get involved. Um, they took my statement concerning David Phillips, but once again, I repeated to them, I'm only here to talk about David Phillips. I'm not here to talk about anybody or anything else. So th there are gonna be people who listen to this and then semantically say, so you gave information to the FBI Correct. about David Phillips. And to them, Ergo, I'm, I'm going to say, and to them, I'm going to say 100%. I do not regret it. I did give information to the uh, government about David Phillips because David Phillips is a is a terrible individual, um, and I stand by that. I stand by that choice. I do not regret it, and I would not change it. So, uh, other than that, what communications have you had with them? You said that they've kind of, that they've yeah, rang they, your rang your phone. Always uh, asking questions, man. Anything that happens, it's like Kenosha, the bomb in Nashville. Uh, anything that happens that has some type of semblance, hey, do you have to know anything about this? Nope. You know I'm not talking to you. All right. Well, we have to make the attempt, attempt to reach out. Well, you've made your attempt to reach out. You know I'm not going to talk to you. Have a good day. Goodbye. And that's what the extent of the conversations have been. So you, you've never actually given them anything other than David Phillips and RT? Correct. Uh, I have no reason to. <laughs> What about after January 6th? Your name your name came up in the impeachment. Actually. I know, I know. It was, it how, was interesting. What, how did January 6th change the layout for you? Um, it didn't really change anything. I mean, uh, the forces that be that were involved, as far as the federal government goes, uh, they knew who was there and who wasn't. I wasn't there until like 6 o'clock that night. I posed in front of the FBI and the J. Edgar Hoover building. Um, I took pictures there. Um, we took pictures elsewhere. Uh, but we weren't directly involved in any of the uh, events that took place the day of January 6th. Returning sort of to the Ukraine situation, Correct. with the amount that the feds are clearly aware of you, the work that you've done, um, are you concerned about the possibility of being on a no-fly list? Do you think that your fast boogaloo activity is going to stop you from being able to actually make it into Poland and then Ukraine? I think that, sorry, I think that from reading online, if you're put on a no-fly list, the uh, DHS has to send you a letter saying you're not on a, that you're on a no-fly list. The problem with people just finding out by trying to fly is because they try to fly so soon after January 6th and found out at the airport they're on a no-fly list. It's been over a year since then, my activities. I've never received a letter saying I'm on a no-fly list. I'm not a threat to national security. Um, so I don't, I don't believe I'm on a no-fly list. Um, and so as far as going to Ukraine, now that uh, there's been this year and a half sort of gap in you being a public figure and then you sort of show up again uh, start doing this stuff there are going to be people who say that this is you trying to rehabilitate uh, a reputation Correct. that you get written off as a fed and you just vanish yeah uh, you come back and now you're on TikTok saying you're going to yeah. fight fight the Russians um, are you trying to rehabilitate the image of Mike Dunn uh, I would not go to a place where I'm going to potentially sacrifice my life with a huge chance of dying for nothing, for a social media presence. Um, I have been documenting it uh, so that people can understand how to do it and people can follow the journey and get actual news of what's going on. Um, and that's the sole purpose of that. As far as returning as a public figure, I could have done plenty of things stateside that are a lot safer than going into the middle of a combat zone to garner uh, a public uh, spot again 
Um, so this is not any attempt to garner uh, public recognition. Um, this is just an attempt to help the people of Ukraine. Dunn, along with a fellow Boogaloo movement participant named Henry Hoft, have continued to post updates on his TikTok since arriving in Ukraine. During the March 3rd interview, I asked Dunn about what it means to bring TikTok to a war zone. What does it mean to be taking TikTok into a war zone? <laughs> It's quite. It's the most Gen Z thing. It I've is ever the Gen Z thing. It's a. It's a. It's. It's rather comical. Uh, it's also going to hurt a lot of people when it comes to operational security. But at the same time, uh, it's real live footage. It's not just the media saying one thing, whether that be the left wing news media, the right wing news media, or someone who's unbiased like yourself. It's. It's going to be real live footage of us people or anybody over there. People uploading TikTok videos now that are they're fighting. It's real live footage of them there in the middle of it explaining what's going on. Um, do you speak Ukrainian? No. Uh, however, most Ukrainians under the age of 40 speak English, as it is becoming a requirement over there. So you think you'll be able to kind of navigate that I think world? I'll be all right. I'm, I'm still going to attempt to learn as much as I can. Um, but it's it's also a very common, commonly spoken language over there with Ukrainians under, under the age of 40. Do you speak Russian? Nope, don't speak Russian either. Um, I mean, honestly, this is obviously a dangerous uh, thing that you're talking about doing. Are you concerned about becoming, for example, a Russian POW? Is that really something you're prepared to do in someone else's war? Well, two, two, a two-part answer to that. One, every war we fought um, since, I mean, I, I would say since even uh, the war of, I'd say since 1865, uh, the, the end of the Civil War. Um, and I'm going to include the world wars. I'd say every war we fought has not been our own war. It's not been for us. Um, I understand the bombing of Pearl Harbor. I understand that it's a retribution thing. But a lot of the wars we've been involved in have not been for necessarily the good of the American people. So I volunteered. I, I signed up at 17 years old uh, with the understanding that I could fight in somebody else's war. Um, as I stated before, I'm against foreign intervention now, foreign militant intervention. Uh, but I'm for volunteers. As far as going over there to fight in somebody else's war and becoming a POW in someone else's war, I believe Russia announced today that uh, any foreign volunteers will not be treated as POWs, uh, which the only thing you can take from that is they will be killed. Uh, I know they, t they spoke of public executions. Um, I don't think anybody can come to grips with that mentally and be mentally prepared for it. I'm not, but at the same time, I'm willing, and that's the difference. I've had a lot of people say, hey, bro, it's not Call of Duty, bro. One, I don't play Call of Duty, uh, but two, uh, I understand it, you know, uh, it's, it's not the point of, I think I'm going to go over there and be Rambo. It's the fact that I'm willing to go over there and help in any capacity that I can, and I'm willing to suffer the repercussions of it. I mean, so, put bluntly, you're really prepared to die for someone else's war. I wouldn't say that I'm prepared to die because no one's mentally prepared to die. But I am willing to die for somebody else's war, somebody else's freedom, someone else's liberty, regardless of my disagreements with NATO or my disagreements with Putin. Uh, I'm, I'm against attacking civilians, and I will stand by those civilians. And from earlier, it sounded like you're planning on being there for the long term? Correct. Uh, so initially, I'm either going to volunteer with the Legion, which I'm turning all my paperwork in for. Uh, if, for whatever reason, not accepted with the Legion, I will volunteer as a foreign national for the Ukrainian army. Which would mean a contract? Of three years, correct. Um, even if this conflict de-escalates, if it correct. returns to the way that I'm it still, was I'm from still gonna 2014 stay over there. to 2020, like... I'm going to stay over there as long as I can. Is there anything else you'd want people to know here in the United States about uh, Mike Dunn going to war in Ukraine? I'd not about Mike Dunn, but I will say that I want people to stand up for what they believe in, defend the Second Amendment, because if you do not, you will end in the same spot Ukraine is, where they have to have an emergency vote to allow their people to bear arms. Their people have to get training because they don't know how to operate those weapons. Uh, learn everything you can, train, and help in any way that you can. If you know volunteers, not just myself, but if you know volunteers who are in Ukraine, um, Send what you can, supplies, uh, money, anything you can do to help, help. Um, and learn that at the end of the day, uh, your opinion only matters so much as your actions that count. And while people have repeatedly judged me for my actions, I'm putting my money where my mouth is. And I'm, I'm going into a combat zone to help defend civilians. And that's, that's all. I mean, if I, I'm very aware of the possibility that I may die. If I do die, I want my legacy to be someone who stood by what he said. Uh, I want people to know that, that I love my country, I love liberty and freedom and the idea of such, and I love what America is supposed to be. Um, I love my family, I love my friends, and uh, Sixth Semper Tyrannus in Slava, Ukraine.